We're here at the Museum of Arts and Digital Entertainment. We're here with the director, Alex, uh, what's your last name again? Alex Handy, I'm the director and founder. And we're also here with Jason. Jason Cutler, I'm the creative and technical director. And uh, what type of exhibit are you going to unveil to the public for this month? We're doing a, an exhibit on the history of sound in video games. Uh, we have sections devoted to game consoles, to music and movie games, uh, computers, as well as uh, some unique... Uh, how, how do you even describe you uh, say? We have a range of games and we feel a representative of the, uh, the great creative span of, of audio design that is, exists in games, from music to games that actually include music in the gameplay, such as Guitar Hero and Parappa the Rapper, to other kinds of games that use music in a weird way, such as uh, Vibriv in a game by the creator of Parappa the Rapper, which actually takes levels and uh, generates its platformer levels from an audio CD, so you can play any of your favorite albums. Uh, we also go back to games that actually have terrific audio from, you know, our childhoods, our sort of nostalgic games like Super Metroid and Mega Man 2. And uh, as you can see behind us, we also do old PCs and old computers as well. And uh, what do you have on display in your collection for the exhibit? Uh, well, we got Zany Golf right here <laughs> on the Apple II GS, which Jason worked tirelessly to get back up and running. And uh, it's, it's quite a loud uh, little game you can hear behind me. We also have Time Bandit for the Atari ST, uh, a game which isn't necessarily notable for its audio design, but is uh, one of the games that we were able to get running and have reliably playable at the museum right now. It's difficult to get these old PCs and games to be run, to, to stay up and running. It's uh, basically a full-time job to keep this stuff alive. Uh, over on the other side here, we have uh, Guitar Hero, and uh, that's supposed to be Guitar Room Man. It's not loading. There it goes. It's loading. <laughs> um, which one was it again? You're going to have to do like interstitial cuts of everything, I think. Okay, there's Guitar Hero. There's Dance Dance Revolution.
is a game where it's not open. Well, like, like, what we would The most recent game you play where it's not open is just... Easy.
What else did you have again? Uh, yeah. Go ahead. Uh, Dance Dance Revolution. Uh, Space Channel 5 on the Dreamcast. Uh, Alex Meets the Proper Rappa on the PlayStation. We have uh, Super Metroid and Super Nintendo. Streets of Rage. Uh, great soundtrack. Ease 1 and 2 on the Trevor Graphics CD. Uh, we also have Robin Arnaud's Deep Sea, which is uh, an audio only game. Uh, created by a uh, member of the IGDA audio group and it's a game that's actually playable with a joystick and sort of a, a headset attachment and the game basically has you uh, killing zombie whales that are coming to get you uh, before before they get you basically you have to figure out where they are and shoot at them using only audio cues. It's, it's an interesting game because it really questions what a video game is because there is no video in the game it's entirely audio you can't see a thing when you're playing yeah, so, it's, a, it's a unique game, and we're the only ones who have a copy. So, practically, it's like a few of the games that Iguana B was showcasing at GDC this year. Uh, this year at GDC, we showcased uh, 3D games. Uh, and uh, Deep Sea, oh, no, yeah, Deep Sea was in the IGF this year, yes. Yeah, I don't think they had it playable at the booth. It was difficult to, you know, it's a very, it requires care and feeding. There's a, there's a whole mask, the gas mask you have to put on with it. It's not really amenable to sort of... Uh, easy public display. That's why it's it, it's better in a, a museum setting. I see. And uh, how long is this exhibit going to be on display? The end of the year, I think. The end of the year? Yes. We'll be open on Saturdays and Sundays from noon to six until the end of the year. Uh, probably, I don't know about Thanksgiving, but we'll figure that out. There's a, On the website, there's a calendar, uh, and you can check it out to find out about us and what's going on. And about acquiring old materials, how far have you gotten in acquiring enough materials to keep all these machines running? Uh, well, in November of 2011, we received the GamePro collection from IDG uh, when they closed down that magazine. That collection included thousands of games and uh, hundreds of consoles, and uh, of course they were all in various states of disrepair. Basically, uh, our staff has worked very hard to make sure that they're still functional and actually able to be used. Uh, Jason here has worked very hard to do that. Manny over there has worked very hard on that. And uh, Manny, you want to talk about how, how much of a pain in the butt it is to get this stuff working? Uh, it took me about two weeks worth of setting all this up. And like two whole days just cleaning the whole place up. And don't forget that like you plug it in and the TV doesn't go to the right channel, so Manny has to come over with his magic remote and put it on video or whatever. It's, uh, it, it's, it's a difficult process to get all these old systems up and running. And what's the status of the Vex tracks? Of the what? Vex tracks. Oh, the Vex tracks. <laughs> <laughs> It's there. It's still in the exact same state it was at GDC. It's over there. It's, we have it wrapped up. Uh, somebody has offered to take it up to Jerry Ellsworth uh, in Seattle to have her fix it. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm confident somebody can fix it, but until then, we're just not touching it. We're keeping it in a cool, dry place until we can fix it. I see. And uh, what do you think about that Cheetah Men 2 campaign that's going on? <laughs> What's the campaign on Cheetah Men 2? What's, is there um, something the guy, new? Some guy's trying to... Um, Fix, like, um, make a new version of Cheetah Man 2. Oh! It's, yeah, the guy who made it, or 
Nice. Uh, I'll, I'll play that. Yeah, the, <laughs> yeah, the angry video game nerd is supporting it. That's how I know about it. Excellent. All right. I'll, I'll, yeah, well, I'll, a lot of people are calling it a scam, though. Oh, it's a scam. I'll play it. Whatever. I'll try it. I'll judge myself if it's a scam. I think we'll know in about three minutes if it plays like the original Cheetah Men 2. I know. I want to I wanna try it, too. Yeah, if it, you know, plays like mud, well, it'll be fun. I can't wait to see that. I've got to ask, is it a scam if it plays like the original, or a scam if it doesn't play like the original? <laughs> that is a good question. I mean, right. Does he want to be true and faithful? Did you ever play Cheetah Men 2? Yes. I, I try and pretend I haven't. <laughs> <laughs> what about uh, Ape? Bioforce Ape is another another good one. Uh, is that going to remake that anytime soon? I don't know. The guy, like that, somebody found that like last year. Did you see that? Mm -hmm. You remember Bioforce Ape? Like, wasn't that last year or two years ago? Somebody found that finally? It was a few years ago. Yeah, that was a good one. That was like, wow. <laughs> and then, oh, uh, the Red Sea. Uh, what's Red Sea Crossing? You see that? The, Atari, the uh, Apple II card? It was, get this, 1983, this dude made a religious Apple II card about Moses crossing the Red Sea, and it's a big platformer. He advertised it in one religious magazine in the local town, and this is the only piece of, uh, like, the only thing that verifies that this is really a thing is this, somebody found the magazine, that maybe there's like a hundred copies of it in the world. They actually found the ad, because this guy just found this at a flea market, and, or like, no, at a garage sale. This guy found this card, and then another really, really rare Atari card, and he's like, huh. And nobody believed him. No, it's the only copy that anybody's ever seen. It's a real, actually produced, labeled part. And uh, everybody thought he was lying until they found the ad. The old stuff is fun. That's just like the uh, uh, Cabbage Patch Kids game that I found. Everybody thought I was lying until we dumped it. <laughs> so, does the museum have those in their collection? What was that? Does the museum have Cheetah Men 2 and all the other games you listed in their collection yet? Is that on the Mega 50? No, okay. that's no. Cheetah Men 1. We don't have a copy of that. No, we don't have it. We don't have Action 52? No. I have a copy personally of Action 52. <laughs> but really? not like the Cheetah Men. That's the one with Cheetah Men 1, right? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. That's, okay, so that's like the legit. Yeah, I have that, I think. No, maybe I don't. I have the Mega 13. <laughs> I have like a multi card NES one that I keep in a, my person. I, don't, I didn't donate my NES stuff to the museum. It's the only thing I kept. Um, no, we don't have a copy of the 52, Action 52. Card. No. If we did, I would have played it. I would say that our NES collection, of all of our collections, of all the consoles, our NES collection is the most anemic and pathetic. We really need more NES stuff donated. We probably only have about, what, what would you say? We don't even have 100 games, do we? We barely have, I would say, like, ranging 70, like, maximum. Maybe 70, yeah. And I think that that's emblematic of the fact that nobody wants to get rid of their NESs. <laughs> I didn't. I didn't want to. What about the Famicom? Uh, he brought the Famicom. Did he? Yes. A fire Emblem? No, I don't. Actually, my family complexion is rather small, unfortunately. Darn. Because I want to play some Fire Emblem 1 and 2 and find out for myself what it was like to play on the actual Famicom for that thing. But I've got the Japanese Man, version of Castlevania 3. You talked to him. I, I gotta go. That's playing it. right now. Definitely want to check that out. Really? What do you want in there for? It's a mess. Is it on display right now? Yep. Over there. Way over there. Anyway, what else has the museum acquired recently? Japanese Saturn games there. Really? Yeah. Uh, yes. Uh, we have a, a donor. Where is he? Philadelphia? Uh, Philadelphia. Philadelphia. He's like, who's donated like about, as of right now, over 100 Japanese Saturn games? I think about what, twice a month we get a, another box from him? Yeah, apparently. <laughs> and it's like, just. And, and good things too. I think we have yeah. several copies of Lunar and. Uh, Well, we just have a bunch of stuff. A lot, a lot of RPGs. Yeah, a lot of RPGs and a lot of oh, Japanese yeah. dating sims. <laughs> um, yeah, there were a lot of 
and like um, also just like when it's not Japanese Saturn games, it's like art books. Um, we had a few GameCube games and like Game Boy, um, not Game Boys, uh, GameCube uh, N64 games. I think we actually have like two sealed versions of the Arcane of Time Majora's Mask. The double disc. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Really? Sealed versions? Huh? Sealed versions? Yeah, sealed versions. We have like uh, one that's open and two that are sealed. So practically you could put those on display, right? Yeah, but they're like somewhere right now. <laughs> <laughs> they're in a box. Hidden from all of us. What about uh, Sonic, Sonic Extreme? Sonic Extreme? Yeah. No, I don't think we have that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Wow. I actually never heard of a game called Sonic Extreme. What is... What's Sonic Extreme? Yeah, what's... Oh, it's that uh, Sonic game that was supposed to be released for the Saturn, but it was never released. It's a cancelled title. Yeah, they're prototypes or... Like, uh, uh, yes, there... I believe that there was a few copies that got out. Oh. Well, we, we don't. We... Our, our collection of uh, prototype software and hardware is pretty limited, and I think our primary focus right now is trying to build up our, our licensed game collection. I mean, we love to add, uh, you know, the oddities and the bootlegs and the uh, and the uh, unlicensed games and prototypes, but you don't come across those nearly as uh, as frequently. So, oh, no prototype it. of Sacred Stones? What's that? So, no prototype of Sacred Stones? Uh, no. Because <laughs> I heard that a few copies of that got out. Okay. But, you know, we do, uh, we do scour the flea markets and garages all yeah, the time yeah, yeah. in the area. And, uh, well, that's how Alex found uh, his, uh, his prototype cartridge. And, uh, you know, we find some amazing stuff. We found uh, an Atari 2600 Junior recently. Uh, and we found a game, I found a game gear yeah, in the box. In the box. So just at the local flea market. Yeah, 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 absolutely. So we get some, uh, we get acquisitions from lots of unusual places. How unusual? How unusual? Uh, let's see. Well, I know I call random guys who don't speak much English at the flea market kind of unusual. <laughs> and then what, um, Alex on his, um, Alex's friend that has like the giant storage. Oh, that's right, yeah, so, uh, yeah, I think that's like one of the more unusual for like PCs. Yeah, that's it, uh, definitely, I forgot about that. Uh, Alex has a friend who's during a, a computer festival, and he has a warehouse out over there. This is the info collection. Where's that? The Stockton. Oh, yeah, Stockton. Stockton. So I drove out there with Alex uh, a few months back. Really have no idea what to expect, and you know when you, know, you said this was a warehouse, this was literally a warehouse. We're talking like fifty thousand square feet of space, and it was just covered. It was, I mean, just filled totally with computers and video games. I mean, this guy had like mainframes. He had teletype machines. He must have had over a thousand Macintoshes. Um, he, uh, he had an absolutely amazing uh, collection. Uh, just hidden away. Uh, I had a similar story of my own a few years ago. So, oh, yeah. <laughs> I found a, uh, a crackhead with a pretty impressive video game. That's some death stuff. You'd be amazed where you, where you find uh, 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 video games. Um, speaking of uh, computer games, how big is the collection at this museum? Um, our collection is pretty. I, I don't I don't have a number really. Uh, our, our curator actually will, do, will be best to answer Can that question. Can you give a, an estimate as to the number of games in our collection right now? So basically, a thousand five hundred plus games at the moment, and we're trying to increase our level. Oh, okay, so we have we probably have well over two thousand games, which still is not that much. 
still not that much. No, it's not that much at all. Well, still too much to fit in my That's right. Yeah, yeah. No, I mean, there are plenty of individuals out there who have way more stuff than we do still. So. But, but that's, I mean, we've acquired all this just in less than a year. Oh, It's like nothing compared to the angry Nintendo nerd? Probably not. Probably not. I mean, if you look at his videos, it's just like wall to wall games. So we got, so we got a lot of games, and hopefully we're gonna keep getting more games. And hardware. And hardware. I mean, we do need a few more system, like old school systems. Um, like what? What, would, what do we need? I know. Let's see. Oh, we're still missing. Uh, did we ever get an Atari 7800? No, we. Uh, no, we don't. I actually. Yes, don't. we don't have one of those. Uh, we're missing some of the rare systems. Uh, we don't have like a laser active or uh, some of the hotter Japanese uh, systems, uh, especially computers. Uh, we're missing some older computers. A lot of Japanese computers. Uh, still a lot to fill in. Especially all those other Fire Emblem games that were never released in America. <laughs> I'm really obsessed with Fire Emblem. You mean, you mean all of them up until the Game Boy Advance? Up until Fire Emblem 6. So, yeah, so all of the Nintendo games, the, actually weren't they on the disc system? Yeah, I believe that they were on the, the first. Disc. The first ones were on the disc system. The first two. The Super Nintendo. The Super Nintendo had three of them. Mm -hmm. They had a somewhat remake of the very first one, but then they cut out a lot of content due to the space of the cartridge. And then they had, and then they had a brand new game on the same cartridge. Although a lot of people didn't like some of the mechanics of that game. And then there were two other ones. One of them was one, one game of its own, and then the other one was a mid quilt. And then there was one GBA game that was never released in America, which featured Roy in, su in the Super Smash Brothers game. Oh. Yeah, and then we got, Roy. The, we got the GameCube game too. Remember, remember that uh, yeah. Super Smash Brothers Melee game, which featured Roy? Yeah, I, yeah. Played, I, used, I played that a little bit competitively. That's why I know the, know the Fire Emblem characters that well. It's the only place I actually know them from. Yeah, that game. Yeah. Um, has museums still considered building their own materials? Building their own materials? Building it as, building their own materials as in, instead of trying to like, try to stock up on as much hardware and components for older, for the older systems, have they, has the museum considered building those same components on their own from scratch? We've discussed it. We're not quite at the point where we have the resources to do that sort of thing, but we certainly hope to in the future. And we feel that it's actually necessary because a lot of these parts are going to start becoming more and more difficult to find, and we have to find ways of you know fabricating reproductions either with you know new three D printing technologies or with more conventional technologies in, in larger runs. But that's all that is still. I see. So, um, I think that's practically all the questions I have, and and uh, thanks for your time. No problem. No problem. Yeah. Thanks.